Okay, so this is Unit 8, Testing and Individual Differences. This is the reading that's covered on page 539 to 555. This is the third video. Um, the video will discuss the level of extremes, um, intellectually disabled and the gifted, so the two ends of the spectrum. Um, and it will also talk about whether IQ is impacted by your genetic makeup or if it's in, impacted by your environmental. Um, influences, so nurture versus nature in terms of intelligence. Okay, so stability and change. A question that is looked at in the beginning of this section is, does IQ change throughout your life? All of a sudden at the age of 30, are you going to become, is your IQ score going to jump and get higher? Um, well, we've talked about this with crystallized and fluid intelligence. Crystallized intelligence is our accumulated knowledge and verbal skills. Again, your crystallized intelligence will grow. It does increase with age. So my facts and bodies of knowledge in terms of maybe some of my psych content, the knowledge that I have in this field, knowledge of teaching, that's going to grow or increase with age. Fluid intelligence, how quickly I respond to things, reason things, is going to decrease with age. So when we were doing our little scenarios with perception, and you guys were supposed to um, answer the questions was, was the color red, blue, green, yellow, red, blue, green, yellow? You guys are probably a lot quicker in terms of finding out the answers to the equations, but maybe get a few wrong. However, I might be really slow, crystallized intelligence, but I know all the answers. Okay. Um, intelligence begins to stay pretty consistent, though, throughout your life. So that score is pretty much going to stay pretty consistent. Um, after they say kind of a certain age, you kind of attain all the intelligence that you can have. So when can you tell that an infant is intelligent? By six months, ten months? Um, how can one uncover an infant's intelligence to tell what their future could uncover? No tests have been created yet. Um, they can't predict about one's intelligence until the age of four. Children's performance on intelligence tests begins to predict their adolescence and adult scores. Um, remember, test scores are taken into consider, um, comparison with the children of their age group. All right, and then they notice that at seven, once you get a certain score, usually let's say your score is 100 on the intelligence test compared to students that are other maybe seven-year-olds, it's going to stay pretty consistent. Then when you take it at eight compared to eight-year-olds, your score is going to pretty much stay 100 in comparison with other kids in your age. Okay, so the extremes of intelligence, we talked about this is the normal curve. Anything above a 130, that 2%, is considered the gifted intelligence. Anything below 70 is what's called intellectually dis um, disabled. Under 70% is intellectually dis um, disabled or intellectual disability is what you may have, formerly known as mental retardation. A child must have both a low test score and difficulty adapting to normal demands of the independent living, okay? Listening skills, verbal skills you're struggling with. 1% of the population, okay, actually meets this criteria. Men usually outnumber females by 50%, so that's huge. And we'll get into this a little bit when we talk about gender differences. Um, so here is the intellectually disabled chart. You might want to pause it and jot down some of the different areas of it. But you may have a mild disability between um, 50, your scores of 50 to 70. About 80% of the population of that 1% is considered mildly intellectually disabled. Many, um, they may have learned learn academic skills up to 6th grade level. Adults may, with assistance, achieve self-supporting social and vocational skills. You may still see them in society doing basic jobs. Okay, they may need some assistance from adults um, in their community. Then you have the moderate, 30, they scored a 35 to a 49. 10% of that 1% population is a moderate level. They may progress to second grade level academically. Adults may contribute to their own support by laboring in sheltered workshops. Again, they may still um, be a part of society doing um, kind of um, jobs with some assistance um, and helping in the community. 
severe, this is you scored a 20 to a 34 on the intelligence test. It's only 3 to 4 percent of that 1 percent population. They may learn to talk and to perform simple wor uh, work tasks under close supervision, but are generally unable to profit from vocational training. A lot of the times they may just stay um, at a school or a, a community in which they live, and there's a kind of people who look after them because, again, they may struggle with learning and talking um, and the basic functions. Profound is below 20%. This is about 1% to 2% of that 1% population. Uh, you're required constant aid and supervision, constant support, constant help. Um, this is somebody that um, is profoundly uh, intellectually disabled. Okay, so being intellectually disabled, which was formerly known as mental retardation, is having significantly below average intellectual functioning and limits in at least two areas. I know on the slide prior to this it says at least one, um, but here, you know, this resource says you have to have two areas. Um, so adaptive functioning skills include maybe you have problems with communication, self-care, taking care of yourself, ability to live independently you struggle with, social skills, um, community involvement, and they, um, the self-direction, health and safety they may struggle with, academic ability they may struggle with, and then they may struggle with um, leisure and work. Okay, so intellectually disabled, intellectually disabled, um, intellectual disabilities sometimes have a known physical cause. So sometimes they know why intellectually disabilities uh, could occur. And one reason why it may occur is because of Down syndrome. For example, if Down syndrome is a disorder of carrying um, severity caused by an extra chromosome 21 in the person's make. Not everybody um, with an intellectual disability, however, is Down syndrome, but some may fall under this category. Society in the 1970s and 19, um, in the 1700s and 1800s kept the intellectual disabled at home and were cared for by family. So society has treated them in different ways. So by the early 1900s, cities were established, um, specifically in the United States, and they were told to send their disabled children to warehouses, providing them little care and support pretty much kind of treated them very poorly. Parents were told to send their kids away before they were attached. No funds in society were really established to help them. They were seen kind of as a problem for society, so let's kind of hide them away. Since the 1950s and until today, there are many programs and centers for the intellectually disabled. Some with minor disabilities are mainstreamed in everyday classroom. Okay, there is still a debate on how education should be handled for the intellectually disabled. Should they be somebody who is taken into their own classroom and worked and challenged there, or they should they be mainstreamed? Okay, Savian syndrome is another syndrome um, that was mentioned in the earlier portion of the text, but I mentioned it here. It's individuals with a remarkable but rare talent, even though they may be mentally deficient in other areas. So they may have a really low IQ score, but are extremely talented in certain areas. So we have Savian syndrome here, um, the case of Matt, a 19-year-old award-winning jazz musician. He scored very low in terms of an IQ test or is deficient in certain areas. However, he's extremely profound and great in music and the talent of music. Okay. So it's a genetic environmental issues on intelligence. The famous question, are we born with intelligence or does our environment cause us to be intelligent? Here's nurture versus nature. Born that way, but does if we're considered we're born that way, many people would consider that we're, we're born with this birthright. However, if, if society influences you, what are the disadvantages in one's environment if you grew up in poverty? So they haven't really figured it out, but these can lead to a lot of challenging issues. So how did they look at this? They looked at this with twin and adoption studies. Okay, one way to look at the issue is to study twins. They studied identical twins, like twins that were from the same egg and they had the exact same genes. They also looked at fraternal twins. They had different eggs and different sperm, so there were different genes. Right? Twin studies indicated that identical twins have a very similar IQ score, if not identical. They also um, show the same brain activity revealed on the brain scans. Identical twins that have been separated at birth and that they live in adopted houses 
proved that genetics can play a factor in IQ. They still pretty much remain consistent even though the environment changed. So this would make one believe that genetics really influences our IQ. Often children are more similar to their biological parents than adoptive. Um, fraternal twins, they couldn't really test in terms of fraternal twins um, if they separated them and put them in adoptive houses because they're two different sets of genes. But they did notice that with fraternal twins, usually twins, fraternal twins, had stronger similar IQ scores than their brothers and sisters. And many people believe it's because they're essentially treated the same because they're both brought up at the same time um, and parents treat them with the same conditions. So that could also be an environmental factor. So since they saw that twins, identical twins, were really influenced by their genes in terms of intelligence, that it didn't really matter that their adoptive parents um, maybe influenced them in their environment because they were more like their biological parents. But people really are still questioning how much do your genes really impact your behavior. We talked about this before. It's really hard to take the environment out of an individual. Okay, we talked about this with if I put two babies in a barrel, okay, identical twins, and had them grow up without society, okay, how much would they be similar and how much would they be different? We can pretty much tell how similar they are based upon pure heritability, their genetics, because they had no outside world. But that's something that's really unethical. You're never out isolated from the outside world to predict how much genes are the major influence in your life. Environmental, they did also see that uh, genes play a large role in one's intelligence, but studies indicate that environment also plays a large role. Early environmental influences, they, saw, they found in numerous cases, the earlier readers, the better the scores. Okay, school and childhood also interact. Okay, school can boost cognitive abilities. Okay, the, I would say the more active one is in school, the, the more Attendance days students are in school, a lot of the times the higher the test scores and the higher the IQ could, could also be a case. Okay, so early in, um, environmental influences, we have seen that biology and experience are intertwined. Nowhere is this more apparent than impoverished human environments such as um, when McVicker Hunt observed in a destitute Iranian orphanage. The typical child hunt observed there could, they could not sit up on assistance at the age of two or walk at the age of four. The little care the infants received was not in response to their crying, cooing, or other behaviors. So the children developed little sense of personal control over their environment. They were instead becoming passive glum lumps. Extreme deprivation was um, bludgeonous in the native intelligence. Aware of both the dramatic effects of early experience and the importance of early invention, Hunt began a program of tutored human enrichment. He trained caregivers um, to play language fostering games with 11 infants, imitating the baby's babbling, then engaging them in vocal follow the leader, and finally teaching them sounds from Persian language. The results were dramatic. By 22 months of age, the infants could name more than 50 objects and body parts and so charmed visitors that most were adopted, an unprecedented success for the orphanage. So here you can see the more enriched the environment you make them, maybe the, the stronger they are going to be intellectually. Um, Hunt's findings are an extreme case of more general findings. Among the poor and environmental con conditions can override genetic differences, depressing cognitive development. Unlike children of affluent siblings within impoverished families have more similar intel intelligence scores. Schools with lots of poverty level children often have less qualified teachers as one study of uh, 1450 um, Virginia schools found. And even after controlling for poverty and having less qualified teachers predicted lower achievement scores. Malnutrition also plays a role. Um, to revive infant malnutrition and nutritional supplements, the poverty effect on physical and cognitive develop lessons. 
So when you're in a very impoverished area, that's going to influence malnutrition. It's going to have kids be um, less fulfilled to want to go to school, to want to put forth effort, to want to cognitively challenge themselves. They also saw less qualified teachers were in those impoverished areas, which means that when you have a less qualified teacher in terms of instruction, the kid is going to be less challenged um, in terms of their cognitive ability. So environment can play a huge role in this. Um, do studies of such early interventions indicate that providing an enriched environment can give your child a superior intelligence, as some books claim? Most experts are doubtful, they're not sure. Although malnutrition, sensory deprivation, and social isolation can retard normal brain development, there is no environmental recipe for fast forwarding a normal infant into a genius. So they don't know yet. They do know that if you limit the kid's ability, don't provide them with food, don't provide them with sensory um, experiences, they're going to get slower, okay, or they're not going to be challenged. There's no recipe in order to speed up a kid's ability. All babies should have normal exposure to sight, sounds, and speech, okay. There was another beyond that. Sanders Scarf's verdict still is widely shared. Parents who are very concerned about providing special educational lessons for their babies are wasting their time. Okay. It is really good in terms of providing them with additional resources. There are gender differences in intelligence test scores. Obviously, the similarities um, outweigh the differences. However, the differences are here. Girls tend to score better in spelling. And at the end of high school, only 30% of U.S. males spell, spell better than the average female. Females excel in verbal skills and remembering certain words. Females have an edge in remembering and locating objects. Um, their nonverbal memory is stronger. Females are more aware of emotions. Females are more sensitive to touch, taste, and odor. Boys tend to be better in math and um, ability. Scores vary between high and low, usually uh, for men. The scores are really high for men and really low for men. And then there's a couple in the middle. Girls usually are pretty average or consistent above the normal bell curve.